Hey, before we get going today, uh, let me just, like, I know we literally just mentioned it, but Easter is a huge opportunity for us, right? And here's what I mean by that. It's a huge opportunity for you. Easter is the one time, there's, there's these, not that, not that we judge people, I don't want to give their own impression, but there's what's called CEOs. Anybody know what that stands for? Christmas and Easter onlyers. It's people who only come to church on Christmas and Easter, which means that we have two really huge opportunities a year, Christmas and Easter. We have this opportunity for people to come to this place and see that their life can be completely transformed, that there is someone who will help them take a next step in their faith, and that church is more than you need to wear a dress, you need to act the right way, and you need, uh, so on and so forth. That you could actually have this transforming relationship with the God of the universe. So, I say that to say, that's the same for you guys. It's the same for our LPY Easter. You have the opportunity to come on that day, bring a friend, bring someone new, come to one of these gatherings, but then also come to our youth gathering, that LPY gathering uh, that's down in the coffee house. So make sure that you utilize that opportunity, okay? So, hey, uh, also before we get going, remember, uh, here at LPY, we want to create a fun environment for you to belong, but also a challenging environment for you to grow, all right? So we, the way we describe that is we go from fun to focus, all right? So we're about to go into that focus mode, which means you need to eliminate the distractions in your life that's going to prevent you from focusing. You can't treat this focus time like a fun time where we have problems, okay? So, if you have friends right around you that's going to distract you the entire time, now's your time to get up, move to a different place. If your friends get up and move, it don't mean they hate you. It actually means that they love you and want you to grow spiritually, okay? If your phone's going to distract you, chunk that sucker. Grace throws it and busts her phone every time nearly, all right? So, get rid of that phone, and that way we can skedaddle right into this time of focus, Okay? So what we're doing to, tonight is, there it, is, there it is, it's nice, I like it. Who can, who can throw their phone against the stage the hardest? Just kidding, don't do that, don't do, oh, oh, we're taking, another, I was just kidding. Do not break your phone, do not break your phone, just kidding, all right? All right, so what we're doing tonight, listen, shh, shh, shh. I'm super pumped about this new series. This series, this new series that we're starting tonight is called The Goat, all right, it's how Jesus was the greatest sacrifice of all time. This is a series that we're going to be doing that leads all the way up to Easter, okay? Riley, bro. Ah, it's chill with the phones. I'm sorry I even produced that problem for you, right? But focus, bro, focus, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Jesus. We're going to look at how his sacrifice was not just cool, not just good, but the greatest of all time, all right? And so, to start tonight, we're talking about how Jesus is the one from God. So, let me start by telling a story, just like I do, all right? Here's what I need you to do right now. I need to envision in your mind cute, wonderful, innocent little five-year-old Clay, all right? I don't know, but I imagine I was probably like this tall. I don't know. Probably as tall as Lincoln is right now, because he's four, about to be five in August. So... If you need like a way of reference, that's probably how tall I was. Probably looked a lot like him. I mean, he looks just like I did when I was that age, so like I was super cute. <laughs> so anyway, five-year-old Clay, I'm in kindergarten, and I can't remember. I think it might have been like two months into kindergarten, which in, when you're five feels like 20 years, right? I mean, like it seems like that was the longest year of my entire life. Uh, but I'm like two months into kindergarten, and I remember... We go to nap time, which I don't know, does nap time even exist anymore? Okay. So we go into nap time. I get my little, I get my little, um, what's that, what are those called? Mats, my little mat to put out. It was Bugs Bunny. It was blue. And I roll it out, and I go to take a nap. And the teacher, who loses her mind, apparently, says, class, before you go to sleep, I just need you to know I've got to step out for a second. So y'all just take a nap. Don't do anything else. Don't get up from your mat. Well, that's dumb. Tell a bunch of five-year-olds, don't touch that red button. And so she leaves, and what do we do? Not me. No, sir. 
I sat on my mat because I was a rule follower of five. But everybody else went nuts. Like I'm talking like this one kid went over to the blocks, grabbed them and just like started chunking them like grenades. One kid took his shoe off and was like, ah, right? Chunked his shoes. Another one, I might as well take both of them off, right? They probably stink. Oh, I do. That's awesome. Sweet. That could not have been better. That's awesome. <laughs> not doing it. You're going to have to look at my toe this entire time. All right, so listen, focus. I know it's going to be hard at this point. <laughs> listen, would it be better if I just took my sock off? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. All right. So anyway, listen, listen. Try to focus in. So, so uh, everybody's going nuts. People were throwing stuff. Shoes, I'm pretty sure I got hit in the head with a shoe, everything. And the teacher walks in. She opens the door and everybody goes, and she flips the lights on and she goes, bananas. Like she's like, what in the world are you doing? And I started screaming and hollering, I told you I'm not, you know. I'm going to get the principal, which in that day and time meant you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life. Everything that you hoped and dreamt for for your life is gone. So she goes against the principal. Now the principal at the time, his name was Mr. Morton. And he was the scariest single man on the face of the planet. Okay? And he walks in. He's massive. And he walks in. And he says, every last one of you out in the hall. Now again, the way five-year-old Clay hears that is, every last one of you go to your deaths. I'm five. So we, <laughs> right, and go out, and we all line up against the wall like we're hardened criminals. And one by one, one by one, he goes down, puts his finger in each five-year-old's face because he is a mean turd. And he says, were you throwing stuff? And every one of them are going. So he's going down the throat, like, mm -hmm, you know. and he gets to me. He goes, were you throwing stuff? And I look at him and I go, no, sir. And he goes, it like took him aback. And he says, I'm going to ask you again, son. Were you throwing stuff? And I said, no, sir, I was not throwing stuff. I stayed on my mat. And he looked at me and he said, I think you're lying, boy. And I said, I said, I said, no, sir, I did not get off my mat. Anyways, he keeps, he goes, he goes down the line. No one ultimately ever got in trouble, obviously, right? Sort of five. But I remember going home, telling my mom this story. And she got enraged that he called me a liar. That was a big deal for her. But I also remember in that moment, like, when Mr. Morton shakes and wags his finger in my face and says, you're a liar. What do, what do you think a five-year-old Clay felt in that moment? No? I oh, wasn't that sad. No? Huh? Anger? I was very mad. I was very mad. And I also felt like cheated. Right? Like I felt like an injustice had been done. And like you have like this dude with authority who like had this particular structure set out of how we should behave ourselves, and I kind of feel like I did. By the way, I didn't. I, I did get up. I did lie, by the way. I, I did. I, got, I, I didn't throw stuff, but, but I, I got up. Right? I didn't throw stuff, but I got off my mat, so I lied a little bit. Anyway, but I felt like this guy has like this particular way that he wants things to go, and I feel like I've done it the way he wants me to do it, and then I still get punished for it. Right? Anybody ever been there? Feel like some injustice has been done to you? Like you follow the rules, you did what you felt like you're supposed to, and boom, you still get punished for it. The reason I bring that up is because I think, I think that that's sometimes the way we view God. I think that that's the way we see God in Genesis 3 sometimes. Like you read Genesis, you read about how God created a humanity, you read about how he crafted Adam and then took from his rib and made Eve. You hear about that and it's like, oh, this is great and wonderful. You get to Genesis 3 and the only thing that, Je that Eve does is take of the forbidden fruit and then she gives some to Adam and he takes of it and then, and then God's like, Whoa! it's like, what in the world? And we look, at, we look at God 
And we see the punishment where God says, get out of my midst, get out of my garden. Eve forever, for the rest of time. There's going to be pain in childbirth. Adam, the ground is going to be cursed under your feet. And forever you will work and you will sweat by the sweat of your brow to bring forth food and vegetation and work. It's going to be miserable for you. Get out. And we look at God, might I say, like Mr. Morton. Like what, why would he do that? Like it almost seems like the, the punishment don't fit the crime, right? Like it seems like God might be a little bit bratty. Like it's my way or the highway. Don't do what I do, then, then, then you're out. You're done. I mean, if we're just going to be honest, like I, I felt that way. I have looked at God's commands. I have looked at what he says is right and wrong, and I've struggled with it. Like that doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. And so what I want to do tonight is to show you a story that kind of maybe puts that in context. We see this story, which you usually hear at Christmas, by the way, of these shepherds at night. They're out in the fields, and they're tending sheep. And this incredible thing happens to them. Look what it says. It says, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. Here's what's interesting about that. Why, uh, here's my question. My question was, why are they scared? Because first of all, let's look at them as the shepherds. Now, you might not know this, but in that day and time, as it really would be today, to be quite honest, shepherds are not the most glamorous people because they're out in the field with sheep. What tends to happen with you if you hang out with sheep and you're out in the hot sun all the time? You stink. You get all, like, all sweaty. You get all sunburnt. You, your, your skin gets weathered. You're not some businessman who everybody looks up to. Not only that, think about this. Imagine you're a shepherd on the night shift. What does that probably mean about you? You're the law of the low. Like you're not just a shepherd. You're the shepherd that got the night shift. So this is the kind of people that we're dealing with. These are people who feel dejected, cast out from their society. People who, who feel like they are not worth much. They are low. In civilization, because they are. And what's interesting about that, and we're going to circle back to this, is it is precisely those people that God chooses to bring these angels forth and to say, hey, there is a Savior being born, as we'll see here in a second. But it says, they were keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them, and they were filled with great fear. My question was, is why aren't they scared? There's a couple of different answers to that, I think. One, angels are probably weird looking. I don't know, never seen one. But I imagine they don't look human lot, and that might be why they're scared. But I think there's a deeper reason why these men are scared. I think if we look at the spectrum of where people are in the mentality with God, these shepherds on the other end of the spectrum of what I just mentioned, they probably do view God as waggy finger Mr. Morton, but they're scared to death of him. They know that they're unworthy because their entire lives, in fact, people have been telling them there's this massive gap. There's this massive gap between you and God. God is this huge, almighty God. He is the God of gods. All of creation was made by him. He is Yahweh. And you better not disobey him. You better not sin against him because he is holy and you have to do these sacrifices. You have to do all of this stuff to try to earn his respect. In fact, if they go further, it's not just some gap and chasm. It's just that you're up here and between you is not only God but all of these holy people that were better than you before. So you're sitting over here. You're sitting over here on this ridge and way over yonder there are these people. These holy people, maybe even your relatives, and the God that you serve, and you, God bless you, you better get after it. You better work hard if you ever want to try to make it to God. Because that gap is huge, and these people know this. These shepherds know this. So, here's what I want to do. I want to think about this, because I think, quite honestly, 
This is where some of us are too. I think there's, some, there's like probably a couple of different types of people in this room right now. There's people who look at God as Mr. Morton and they get upset with him and think he's a brat. That's unfair. But then there's also a group of people in here and you're just like the shepherds. You feel like God is mad at you. You feel like, yeah, you understand he's holy. You understand that he's big. But you're also like, that intimidates me. That pushes me away from God. I'm scared to death of him. And then I think there's also, there's some of you in this room who think you can get to God yourself. Like, if I can just go to church enough, you'd never say that because you know it's theologically wrong, but that's the way you live your life. If I just go to church enough, if I just, if I just like, read my Bible, if I go to enough Bible study, if I pray enough, if I, like, surround myself, don't do enough, if I don't do bad things, then, like, maybe I can make my way to God. And so that's where we get this illustration. So here's what I want to do. Dez, will you come up here for a second? Come on over here. So for those of you who don't know, Dez is a record-breaking athlete, right? Dez broke the triple jump rep record for the Aberville High School. Ain't that right? Yeah. Ain't that right? What was your distance? 44 feet. Four, 44 feet plus 40? No, no, no. no. That's 84 feet, bro. No, 44 feet. That's incredible. Round of applause for Dez. All right, so we're going to challenge Dez a little bit tonight. We're going to put him to the test uh, on his jumping abilities. Je- Dez, here's what I need you to do. Yeah, get yourself ready. You're going to be ready right here, okay? Put him through some, t- yeah, empty those pockets. Just ignore my toes sticking out of this sock, bro. All right, here's what I need you to do. Everybody, like, you got to cheer him on here. Mike, maybe we can get him here. Not yet. I need you to jump from this line to that one. From this line to that line, all right? Just jump. Not yet. You got to wait. I got to say one, two, three, go. You got to jump from this line to that one. Can you do that? All right. All right, everybody. Everybody get them ready. Everybody ready? Ready? One, two, three, go. Fantastic. Fantastic. Actually did much more than I said. I just said this line to that line, which even I can do. All right. Here's what I need you to do, too. Do you think, Dad, that you could jump from right here to this line over here? Can you do that? You can get a running go if you'd like. You good? All right, he's good. You all right? Let's see if you can do it on three, okay? Right there to the, that line right there. Right here. You got to start right here. Right here. This line in the, I'm sorry, there is a line there, isn't there? That would have been smart to go from the paint to the paint, but I'm not. Right here, okay? Ready? One, two, three, go. Made it. Good job. Good job. All right, so here's what I need you to do now. I need you to get a run and go. Okay? And I need you to jump. Do you think... Like maybe come down here. I ain't enough room on that stage. Can you jump, do you think, from this green square to that green square over there? you think that's possible for you? Yeah, like start from that wall. Run as, as hard as you can. Yeah, I mean, start from as far back as you need. Jump from that green square and make it to that one. You think you can do that? All right, we go. Here we go. On three, okay? Everybody got to cheer them on, all right? All right. One, two, three, go. Oh, nice. 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 All right, you ready for your next challenge? All right, here's what I need you to do now, Dez. So let's just, let's just recap for a second, all right? Everybody sit down. Everybody sit down. Everybody sit down. Let's just recap for a second. Dez has done three successful jumps right here. Longest one being from this green square to this green square, which looked rather easy to me for him, right? It was impressive. So I think, Dez, that you can go way more than that. I mean, if you, I mean, think about 44 foot. That was not 44 foot, right? So here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to the, literally, go to the back of that wall. And I need you to run as hard as you can. And I need you to jump from this green square all the way to the other side. Can you do that? Can you do that? Just go ahead and try for me, all right? Yeah, to the other end of the wall. Are you ready? Everybody ready? 
this green square all the way to the other wall. I, I, feel, I feel like you, I feel faith in you. All right, you ready? One, what? No, one jump, bro. All right, ready? One, two, three, go. Oh, that's hand of applause for Dez. Hand of applause for Dez. Hand of applause for Dez. All right, so listen, listen. Shh, shh, shh. Here's why I got Dez to do that. Dez is obviously a heck of an athlete. He, he's a heck of an athlete. Broke a school record. And I think, listen, listen closely, or this illustration is not going to make any sense to you, right? I think that, that right, what we just saw there is kind of the way we view our relationship with God sometimes. We see this gap, and we have like these illusions that either the gap is small enough to where I could just like get to God if I wanted to. Like when I get good and ready, like I'll just be good enough to woohoo, God, me and God, woohoo, it's going to be awesome, right? And we never consider that maybe perhaps the gap that we're trying to jump is entirely too big to get across. In fact, it's ridiculously big. Like it would be farther. It would be farther than if I were to say, Des, jump from that green square to the 431. Like that would obviously be ridiculous. Here's reality. This is what I'm about to say right here. Here's what I'm about to say. There is nothing you can do on your own to clear this gap to get to God. I don't care how many Bible studies you attend. I don't care how many times you come to church consecutively in a row. I don't care how much you don't do. I don't care if you don't do drugs, don't get tattoos, don't have sex, don't do all of these things that we say you you think you shouldn't do. None of that is going to reduce the gap between you and God. In our cute human minds... We start believing, if I'm just good enough, if I'm just impressive enough, this gap will shrink down, and when I die, I'll get to go, woohoo, and go right into heaven. That's why everyone gets to heaven. Yes, Dad. Yes, sir. Lost his stuff. What? I'm not sure what you said, but we're going to continue on. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. But we think if, like, maybe if I could just do enough, I could get this gap closed. And that's why, look, look here, look what it says. It says, and the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. So let me just catch you up on what just happened. These shepherds are scared to death because these angels show up. And these angels say, Hey, don't be afraid. Fear not. There's a baby, a Savior born. He's in Bethlehem. Go to him. He is the Savior. He is the Christ, the Savior of the world. And look what, they, look what it says. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. If you're not careful, if you're not careful, you'll look at this story that you've heard every single Christmas of your entire life. And miss the importance of what you just read. Because something clicks for these shepherds that changed them in such a way. to Where it says, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. These shepherds, these outcasts, these low of lows. These people who were insignificant in society. Who stank, who were on the night shift. They they hear these angels and they, they start telling everybody, hey... Let me tell you what I heard. Let me tell you what this angel told me. That the Christ has been born. That there is a Savior and He is here. And again, my my question is why? Why does this make such an impression on them? I'll tell you why it did. The reason why this made such a big deal to them and it made such an impression upon them 
It's because this right here, that one declaration, there's a baby born. He is Christ. He is the Lord. It takes the weight and the shackles off of them that they've been holding their entire lives. Suddenly this means, suddenly this means that God's not just mean old Mr. Morton wagging his finger at them and he's so powerful and he's so distant and they're scared to death of him that they could never actually make it across the gap. Instead, now these prophecies, these promises that they've been told their entire lives have come to true. And this is, this is the, the truth that they realized. That you want to get across the gap. If you want to make it to God, you want to make it to this incredible place in of eternity where you get relationship with your Father who created you. You want God to be more to you than just this scared, like Mr. Morton wagon fingered turd. You want an actual relationship with God rather than just being afraid of Him all the time. The way to Him is not to try to make the gap smaller, it's not to try hard, it's not to do enough Bible study, it's not to preach enough sermons, it's not to lead enough songs, it's to go across the cross. That is the bridge to God. Because that baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes, is the reconciliation that brings us back to the Father. He is the Savior that bridges the gap between us and our Maker. That's why Jesus said this. Or, this is the bottom line tonight. Or no, Jesus said this. This is what this says. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Here's the bottom line for not. Stop jumping by yourself. Start resting in Him. Stop trying to jump. No matter how good of a run and go you get, you're just going to fall down in the pit of the gap. You're never going to make it to the other side. Quit trying to shrink the gap. It'll never get short enough or small enough for you to just hop on over on your own. But the incredible thing about the gospel, the incredible thing about that baby in that manger that those angels told them shepherds about, he is the bridge. And all you got to do is walk across the bridge. You ain't got to try hard. You ain't got to try to impress Mr. Morton, you ain't got to try to impress some mean old God who's just waiting for you to mess up. You ain't got to like make all these sacrifices. You have to rest in Jesus. That's why Jesus said this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, some of you in here, I think, you're like shepherds. You feel so insignificant in the world in which we live that you think that maybe even God couldn't have anything to do with you. You're just an outcast of outcasts. Not only does everyone around you not think very highly of you, but God doesn't either. And there's some of you in here, maybe you don't struggle with self-confidence, but you're just like shepherds too, and you think that you can just earn your way to heaven. Or it's just going to all work out in the end. Like, I'm going to die, and then everybody just goes to heaven because that gap goes together. It don't. Your shepherds who are scared to death, or you think that you can work your way to God. And then they're some of you are shepherds in here and you're scared of God. Wherever you're at this evening, there's one solution to whatever kind of shepherd you are. It's the cross. It's Jesus. I know that sounds churchy and it seems cliche, but it's true. He is the one from God who provided the only way to bridge the gap. And he did it on a cross. He took the place for you because you deserve death because we created that gap. When God, we created the gap. And he died in your place so that he could bridge, 
make a way for us to get to God. So wherever you're at this evening, maybe you're carrying all this guilt, maybe you're carrying all this shame, all of this pressure. You feel like you gotta outperform, you gotta do good, you gotta like, you can not mess up. And I'm just telling you, take every bit of that to Jesus because he says, come. Everyone who's tired, wore out, you've been trying on your own for entirely too long, just come to me. I will give you rest. Stop trying to jump on your own and start resting in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, God. Thank you for these students. Thank you for the opportunities that you give us to speak your truth. And Lord, I just pray that your word would seep into our souls. Lord, it wouldn't just be some cool graphic up on our screens. wouldn't just be some pages in a book that's been bound for us to read. Instead, Lord, your word would be living and breathing that would give us life. It would be the source that we need to draw upon to understand and know that life is about relationship with you and the only way that relationship happens with you is through your son. That yeah, Bible study is good. Prayer is good. Super important that we go to church. Super important that we come to Easter. Super important that we invite our friends. But they in and of themselves are not the solution to the problem of our hearts. That you are the solution to the problem of our hearts. Your cross, your resurrection is the solution to the problem of our hearts that you provide the way, that you provide the reconciliation. And Lord, I just pray if there's any here in this room right now that don't, have never taken of, that, taken of that free gift. They don't know freedom. They're just scared shepherds because they've never received your gospel. They've never received your free gift of eternal life, Lord. Would you just speak to them tonight? That you would give them the bravery to talk to their small group leader so that they can get right with you and have relationship and freedom in you, Lord. And those of us who are in this room right now, Lord, that do know you, that we are your children, I just pray, Lord, that you would use your word, use your gospel, use the cross to push and flush out all of the garbage in our lives, the difficulty, the shame, the guilt, all of the stuff, that, all of the baggage that we bring to the relationship. And understand and know, Lord, that your burden is light and your yoke is easy. All we have to do is come to you and rest in you. We can literally bring everything that we have and lay it on you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Here's what I need.